Amen. To Elohim be all the glory and honor and power. We bless him for the privilege of being able to receive from the Lord the understanding of the kingdom from a scriptural point of view, not from the point of view of humanistic wisdom. We are going through the Bible. The Lord is showing us what is in the Bible, showing us what to do, how to do it, showing us the principles and patterns of the kingdom. And by the grace of the Lord, in the last lesson on Friday, we got to lesson 13 of course 111, Yeshua and the kingdom part one. Today, by the grace of the Lord, we are going to be looking at Yeshua and the kingdom part two in lesson 14. Let us pray. Father in heaven, Thank you for the privilege of receiving from you. We pray that your spirit will breathe upon the word, the breath of life, and speak to our hearts now, that all honor and glory will be ascribed to you. In Yeshua Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Brothers and sisters, we thank the Lord for the opportunity to discuss, and I want to say this to us. The kingdom of Elohim is also known as the kingdom of heaven. It was a core focus of the preaching and teaching ministry of Yeshua. And, you know, there are some people who try to confuse people. Kingdom of God is different from kingdom of heaven. And they try to spin words and spin words and spin words and people get confused. Don't be confused. We know for surety that the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God are referring to one and the same thing. It's just a matter of semantics. And we need to understand that Matthew wrote for the Hebrew audience, the Jewish audience. And in the Hebraic tradition, you don't call the name of God anyhow. The name of God is so hallowed that even to write Yahweh, they write Y-H-W-H. So they don't call. And so Matthew wrote for a Jewish audience, he had to be sensitive. So he had a lot of references to the kingdom. So he couldn't have said kingdom of God, kingdom of God, kingdom of God. He will have offended the sensitivities of his readers. So he said the kingdom of heaven. And of course, the kingdom is also the kingdom of heaven governing the earth dream in the heart of people. And so men and bread, on the other hand, if you check, you see that Luke and Mark wrote about the kingdom of Elohim, the kingdom of God. And it's important to know that Elohim created heaven and earth. The heaven is the realm of his kingdom, where his throne is, where he lives, where he, from where he rules. And then the earth is the realm of the same kingdom of heaven that he now gave to the sons of men, according to Psalm 115 verse 16, the heaven. Even the heaven are the Lord's. But the earth had he given to the, son, to the children of men. And you have a legal right in the earth dream because this earth dream is given to the children of men. And that's one of the reasons why Yeshua had to be incarnated in a human body because Elohim does not break his law. Yeshua had to come in a human body to pay the price for sin, to go through lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and pride of life, the temptation that Satan used to trip Adam and Eve over. He had to take it all upon himself in Matthew chapter 4 and overcome in the flesh. So it's so important for us to know something, that before we can truly exercise authority in the earth realm, we are required to be subject to the authority of the king. It's so important. And that is why it's so that we need to understand that walking in understanding of the dominion mandate in Genesis 1, 26 to 29, it is meaningful when we are under the governmental rule of Elohim, we submit to the authority of Yeshua as the King and Lord of our lives. It's so important because the reason why Adam and Eve fell was that they failed there. When Satan came to them, they submitted to Satan and forsook the word of Elohim. But the day is coming. Hebrew, I mean, Revelation 11, 15 says, And the seven angels sounded, and there was great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Messiah, and he shall reign forever. A day is coming 
when Yeshua, who rules inside our heart now, will rule over the earth rim in a full sense. So we need to understand. Let me just say to you something to, to help you. If you have pen and paper, write down these uh, uh, scriptures just to know that the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God are one and the same thing. Write down, compare Matthew 11, 11 to 12 with Luke 7, 28. We are talking about what we call parallel scripture. Scripture speaking about the same thing as recorded in Matthew, as recorded in Luke or in Mark. Then Matthew 13, 11, compare with Mark 4, 11 and Luke 8, 10. Compare Matthew 13, 24 with Mark 4, 26. Compare Matthew 13, 31 with Mark 4, 30 and Luke 13, 18. Compare Matthew, 20, uh, Matthew 13, 33 with Luke 13, 20. Compare Matthew 8, 3 with Mark 10, 14 and Luke 18, 16. Compare Matthew 22, 2 with Luke 13, 29. In each instance, Matthew used the phrase kingdom of heaven, while Mark or Luke used the phrase kingdom of God. So clearly, the two phrases refer to the same thing. Don't be confused about this. Don't let any, you know, verbal gymnastic confuse you. It's the same concept, the rulership of heaven, the rulership of Elohim in the heart of people and in the fullness of time when heaven will fully invade the earth rim and Yeshua will reign with all, all in, and be all in all. For now, let's remember what we studied some scriptures back. That there are three dimensions of the kingdom. Number one, kingdom within. This is when we surrender our heart to Yeshua to rule and reign. When we have, you know, taken off self from the throne of our heart and then we have gone beyond embracing him as savior and who will take us to heaven when we die to enthrone him as Lord in our lives today. Then number two, kingdom nation is a community of believers who have pressed into this state where they are the dominion of Elohim. Elohim by his Messiah, Yeshua, is exercising dominion over us. It doesn't matter whether you are from China, from North Korea, South Korea, whether you are from Israel, whether you are from Africa, whether you are from South America or North America, whether you are from the Pacific Islands. If he's exercising dominion over my life, over your life, we are brethren. It doesn't matter where you came from. So in this present time, there's a kingdom within the hearts of those who have submitted to the sovereign rule of Yeshua. And then number three, there's the kingdom to come or the manifest kingdom, which is going to be in the earth rim when he puts down all rebellion. And for 1,000 years will rule here on earth. It will be a continuation of Eden. No death, no sickness, no confusion, no terrorism, no evil of any sort, no lie, no cheating, no fraud. It will be universal righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Ghost and he will rule alone if you allow him to reign in the throne of your heart in the now if you pay the price to surrender self to him to rule and reign in you now then when he returns you will be a co-heir and co-ruler of the kingdom why because it is unnatural man likes to rule himself Man likes to be independent. So for you to die to self and allow Yeshua to take over and you live purely by Holy Spirit who leads and guides you in all things, then you have achieved something that is unnatural. When he comes, the promise is just as you suffered with him, you're going to reign with him. So we need to understand that the biggest problem of Christian religion, especially churchianity, is that even when they, it allows you to receive some truths about redemption, like in evangelicalism, like in Pentecostalism, that you are saved, it leaves, keeps you at the place of salvation. It teaches you enough to embrace Yeshua, Jesus, as the Savior, who essentially will take you to heaven when you die, 
but he doesn't teach you enough to enthrone him as king. If he was king, we won't have all the politics we have in the household of Elohim. We have all the skullduggery. We have all the people trying to show one face publicly inside the another face. If people had enthroned Yeshua as king, he'll be king anywhere, anyhow, in the house, in the behind the scene, in the public, anyhow, anywhere. We're going to be experiencing the same king by his spirit. Men and brethren, in this lesson, we'll do a survey of the gospel account of Matthew, who was recruited to tell the Jews that the long-expected Messiah spoken by the prophets had indeed come. And if you check his uh, gospel, it was essentially to confirm what was spoken about the Messiah. Secondly, uh, Matthew was chosen as biographer of Yeshua and to document he who will restore the kingdom to Israel, the things he taught, the things he preached, and the way he announced the kingdom. And so, men and brethren, if you get it, if you can get this understanding, then let's go in to study what we have today. We want to look at today Bible references to the kingdom of heaven in the, in the gospel of Matthew, what he said. Let's go. In Matthew 3, 2, repeat, you know, John the Baptist said, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Okay, that's not that. Let's look, let's start from Yeshua, the king of the kingdom, what he himself said. In Matthew 4, 17, from that time, Yeshua began to preach and to say, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's receiving the heart. That's where repentance takes place, is in the heart. Just like John the Baptist, Yeshua didn't invite you to go and meet him in the temple because the Lord had ordained that a new temple would be in the earth rim, the mobile temple of the hearts of men. He said, repent there, repent there. Then, in verse 23, Yeshua went about all Galilee, preaching in their synagogues, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And healing all manner of sicknesses and all manner of disease among the people. So, in Matthew chapter 4, after the baptism of John in Matthew 3, in Matthew chapter 4, the Holy Spirit led him to the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And thereafter, we just we see the very first message of Yeshua repeated twice Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And he preached the gospel of the kingdom. He didn't preach churchianity. He didn't come to found Christian religion. He didn't come to teach you how to fill uh, temples and church buildings with people. He came to teach you how the kingdom should fill the hearts of people to the point that people no longer exist. They are dead to self and the kingdom is visible in their life, in their preferences, in their priorities. So in that regard, the Sermon on the Mount which was the next chapter, was purely an exercise in showing the executive summary of the blessed kingdom of Elohim, how it should function in the earth realm. So in Matthew 5, 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who recognize their lack, who recognize their need. Blessed are those who recognize that life without him is meaningless. That recognize that if they rule their own self, they are toast to the devil. Blessed are they. Why? Because they are going to possess the kingdom. The kingdom is possessed to the extent that the king possesses you now. Matthew chapter 5, 10. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The same concept. If you are persecuted for righteousness sake, you do the right things and people come against you, you are blessed. You know why? Yours is the kingdom. But in the now, as in the rulership, the king will find in you a beautiful environment to dwell in. And when he returns in glory, you have your reward. That is why there will be a surprise on the last day. Those who have laboring for the Lord, suffering for the Lord, they will be rewarded on the last day. And then in verse 19, he says, Whoever shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. You see, the kingdom values those who 
teach the full truth, not cherry picked, not pick this little bit here and there, who teach the whole counsel of Elohim, to, who teach the full truth of Elohim. He said, blessed are they. You see, if your righteousness comes to the point you do not allow yourself to believe that anybody can break any commandments. No. Yeshua didn't come to destroy the Torah, for instance. He came to fulfill the Torah. There are two different things. So those who teach he came to destroy, you make yourself in such a way that you can begin to live anyhow. But if you teach that he came to fulfill, then what does it mean? It means what you couldn't fulfill in the Torah, what you could not struggle to fulfill, the handwriting of ordinances that was against us and contrary to us, he has come and taken it and paid and nailed it to his cross and set us free. And all I need to do to be deemed righteous in the presence of the Father is not to fulfill 600 and something laws, but to believe in Yeshua who died for me, to believe it in the heart, confess it with the tongue, then I draw down the righteousness of the Father in him, draw down the power of heaven in him, and I begin to live not by my strength, but by his strength. That's why he said in Matthew 5, 30, Matthew 5, 20, For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. So he now says, Lusten, this is a higher law. Some people think the New Testament is cheap and, uh, you know, because they've misunderstood grace. Listen, if you don't know the law, you cannot appreciate grace. The law tells you your helplessness, your inability, your incapacity to please Elohim in your flesh. And grace tells you that Yeshua has paid the price for you. If you believe, you receive the grace to live above. So, the one in the kingdom, your standard is far more than anyone in religion. It is so important we get this. That's why the Lord began to teach them concerning prayer, the need to make the kingdom the fulcrum of everything you do in prayer. He says in verse 9 and 10 of Matthew chapter 6, After this manner therefore pray ye, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. That's awesome. Let your kingdom come in two dimensions. Let it come into my heart now. Me who have prayed, let your kingdom come when I submit to the rulership of Yeshua in all things. Then too, when he will return to rule and reign in the manifest kingdom, let it come. In other words, believers were supposed to Bear in mind the two dimensions. Today, who is ruling my heart? This evening, who is ruling my heart? When I wake up, let me enthrone him. As you wake up in the morning, consciously enthrone him in your heart. Surrender to him. Allow him to propel us through the day. And also, we ought to have our mind fixed on the reality that the, all that the world is seeking will not come to pass until the day he comes to rule and reign in the kingdom. And so for that reason, the Lord now said some things that are very, very, very important. One of them is this. The kingdom cannot be subordinated or play second fiddle to any other pursuit. It is to occupy prime place in hearts of the redeemed. That's what he said in Matthew 6:19. Lay up for yourselves, lay not up for yourselves treasures upon the earth, where moth or rust doth corrupt, where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. Then he went on to talk about the, the verse 24 No man can serve two masters. For either you hate the one and love the other, or else you hold on to one and despise the other, you cannot serve Elohim and mammon. Then he now say, take not for your life what you shall eat, what you shall drink, nor yet for your body what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body more than raiment? Then he began to give us instance and then he says in verse 33, But seek first the kingdom and its righteousness and all other things shall be added to you. That's the deal the Lord offers us. 
if we seek the king and his kingdom and let him take over our life, the things people are struggling for, he will cause them to come to us. Be attracted to the king, and the king will attract to you all their locations for your assignment. That's what is important of Matthew 6, verse 19 to 34. And then the Lord now also lets us know that those who did not enter the kingdom at the straight gate of true genuine conversion, and who do not walk the narrow way, Kingdom life is the narrow way. Such people are in self-destructive deceit. They will be rejected on the last day, despite the assumed great works. That's what he meant from Matthew chapter six, verse uh, nine. Matthew chapter seven, from verse thirteen, he said, "Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction." You see that all over, brothers and sisters who believe in the Lord, but they don't want His kingship. They, they believe in him. They believe on him, but they don't want to be followers of him. And he said, listen, to believe in me is cheap. The devils believe, the demons believe that he is Lord. That's why they bow at his name. He said, it is cheap to just believe on him. What matters is to enthrone him as Lord. And then he says, hey, and to enthrone him as Lord, the starting point is to be genuinely converted. So if you are in church and you are not converted, your name is not in the Lamb's book of life. If you are in church and you live by the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, you are deceiving yourself because on the last day, he has nothing to guarantee you. And that is why he said, not everyone in verse 21 that says, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many shall say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name have done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that walk iniquity. This is awesome. Matthew seven thirteen to 23. That on the last day, people will discover you use his name to divine, conduct your satanic divination. And use his name to slap up upon it, to think that that means he will be accepted. Use his name to guide money out of people. Use his name to deceive and to do all manner of things. On the last day, we will know whether you were wise enough. And the Lord said to his people, be careful. Make the right choices now. And that is why Yeshua also taught us something important. That the kingdom is for his universal family. The Jews and the Gentiles. All people from Asia, people from Africa, people from North America, South America, the Caribbean, people from Europe, people from the Pacific Islands, the kingdom is for all. And that's why he warned the Jews of his day in Matthew 8, 11, And I say unto you that many shall come from the east and from the west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven on the last day. Surprise! And those who were the natural inheritors of the promises will miss it. Then he made it clear that while there are many true disciples of Yeshua, you know, there are many things the disciples of Yeshua can deal with. The core of our message, the core of the message of the disciples should be the kingdom of heaven. If there's something missing from the theology of the modern church it is the teaching and preaching of the kingdom so he said to them his disciples in matthew 10 7 and as you go preach saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand brothers and sisters this message needs to return repentance why for the kingdom of heaven is at hand let people repent and make their way straight. Nobody knows when death will come. Nobody can predict how long, how many months, how many years. Nobody will predict. So the biggest decision anybody can make is to take your whole self and cast upon the Lord and ask him for mercy because sin can be very debilitating. Sin can consume somebody. And it's like a hole. You can't come out of it. But the Lord say, you know what? Yeshua has paid the price. He's stretching out a lifeline. Even as this world is going on now, I don't know what you're struggling with. Struggling with lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. Struggling with 
a particular demonic bondage you held in you, all you need to do is to cast yourself upon the rock that is Yeshua and say, forgive me, Lord. I receive your mercy and I believe you died for me and that settles it. So he told them to preach that the kingdom is at hand. And today, when everybody is preaching how much you can occupy the mountains of society, and there's nothing wrong in occupying the mountains of society, it is our inheritance to be the top and not below, to be the head, not the tail. But he didn't call us to go and have pursuit of mountains to occupy because the Lord has already ordained that he himself by his favor will lift us up as we excel in whatever we are doing, and the Lord wants us to pursue the kingdom. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Live in the light of eternity. Live in the reality that the kingdom is going to come with the return of the king and make it a consuming passion of your life to be invested in preparation for his own return. Men and brethren, he also declared a profound truth. Heaven has high esteem of those who are truly kingdom citizens. Heaven has high esteem of those who are truly kingdom citizens. Take note of that. You know what Yeshua said about John the Baptist and us? Matthew 11, 11, very, very, I saw unto you, among them that are born of women, among those who are born of women, natural people, they had not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Right from Moses, to the very last, John was the very last of all those of the old covenants. <laughs> he said, there's none is greater than John the Baptist. Notwithstanding, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Why is this so? Because we are in the world on the other side of the cross. John was before the cross. He saw in a figure Yeshua. He handled Yeshua the baptism. But the messiahship of Yeshua, the fulfillment of the messiahship when he suffered at the cross and poured out his blood, that today we can, by faith in what he did, we can repent of our sin and take a plunge into the pool of the blood and get cleansing from our sin. We who are here, he said, the least of us is the greater than John the Baptist. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that awesome, brothers and sisters? This is how highly the Lord esteems kingdom citizens and ambassadors. So the question I want to ask you, are you a kingdom citizen? Are you an ambassador? Are you a kingdom citizen? Are you an ambassador? Are you a kingdom citizen and ambassador? Let him come. Are you a kingdom citizen and ambassador? If you are, if you are genuinely saved, if you are a disciple of Yeshua, he says you are greater than the greatest of the Old Testament prophets. Men and brethren, that's why also the Lord declared that the kingdom is not a casual proposition. It's not something you can just, you know, you go into that building that looks beautiful, the music is beautiful, the decoration is beautiful, people have great reputation, the billboards and all that. No, the kingdom is something more. And he said in Matthew chapter 11, verse 12, from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffered violence and the violent take it by force. Telling us that the kingdom is not something you thrown into casually. The kingdom, just like in the days of John the Baptist, John said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And as he preached that, John didn't point them to the temple. John went into the wilderness and then we are told that all Jer Jerusalem and all Judea followed him to the wilderness. And he preached to them and said, who had warned you to escape from the rock to come? We are told that the religious leaders, the soldiers, the custom and revenue officials, they all were crying, taking a plunge towards John, going for his baptism. He said, listen, that's the same way. The kingdom, you know, they've told you there are so people who have a lot of interpretation about the kingdom being violent people, as in demonic people trying to take the kingdom. Well, these things can be logic you can draw if you want to. But the flow of the revelation is that the kingdom requires intention, intensity, in 
requires focus. It requires intentionality. That you look at your life, your life doesn't meet up. You look at how you've been living, as they say, in a place called Owere, Nigeria, Omerepe. What you are doing? Omerepe. That lying life, omerepe, that cheating life, omerepe, that evil life, omerepe, all the games you play with God, omerepe, you come to the place where you realize, no, omerepe, and you take a plunge to the Lord in violence. I won't leave you unless you bless me. Lord, break up this thing in me, this stronghold. I reject it. I renounce it. I repent of it with violence. That's how you take the kingdom. The violence of repentance. The violence of intentionally plunging into the mercy of Elohim that he offers. You don't go into it casually. You know, our sister Benedict asked a question the other day. We did the open day. And I hope you understand. That is the context in which he meant it. That you take everything you are. Your mind. Your heart. Your ego. Your position. You plunge into the mercy of Elohim. And you cry to him until you know he has lifted it up. And then you rise up, you know that you've possessed the kingdom because the king is now seated in your throne of your heart. And so Yeshua began to give the parables of the kingdom. And in giving the parables of the kingdom of heaven, he adopted a principle. And that principle you find declared in 2 Samuel 22:27, Where the pure, that will show that I said pure. With a forward, thou will show thyself on Savory. Elohim has a way with him. If you are sincere with him, you'll find him a sweet father. If you try to be crafty with Elohim, he will let you be caught into the net of your own craftiness. The same concept in Psalm 18, verse 26. With a pure, thou will show thyself pure. And with a forward, that will show that I say forward. So if you want to play games with the Lord, he gives you a lasso. He gives you a rope. You take it, you call yourself and call yourself around yourself. You find that you are dangling at the end of a rope. You are the person in danger. He is seated on the throne. He sees everything. There's nothing on earth. It's, like, it's just like us. Ant and ant comes before you and begins to play game. You can see everywhere the ant is going. You can see. You can take your hand and prick the ant. So also Elohim wants us to know. His eyes are purer than to behold iniquity. He's omniscient. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere, all the time, simultaneously. And that same Elohim says, I know your thoughts. I know your mind. I know your will. I know your emotion. You can't hide from me. You cannot take a facade and put on a mask. I know you. I know you're sitting down. I know you're upstanding. So the Lord is saying in Titus 1.15, the same concept Unto the pure, all things are pure. But unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. But even their mind and conscience is defiled. And that is why, brothers and sisters, the Lord says, before you can understand the word, First Peter 2, 1-2 says, Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings as newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word that may grow thereby. There are things we must put off before we can receive the rhema of the word. There are things we must lay aside before the word can bless us and it won't bounce off us. What is that? Why is he saying so? Because Yeshua told his disciples something one day about the parables. In the book of Matthew chapter 13, Verse 10 to 17, the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you, the disciples, to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But to them it is not given. For whosoever hearts, to him shall be given that he may have more abundance. <laughs> but whoever, whoever has not... <laughs> From him shall be taken even that which he had. Therefore I speak to them in parables. Because they seeing, see not. And hearing, they hear not. Neither do they understand. Verse 14. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, that is Isaiah, which said, By hearing you shall hear, 
and shall not understand. And seeing you shall see and shall not be perceived. For this people's heart is wax gross. Their ears are dull of hearing and their eyes have they have closed. Lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and shall understand with their heart and shall be converted and I shall heal them. But blessed are your eyes for they see and your ears for they hear. For very like so unto you that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see the things which you see and have not seen them and to hear the things which you hear and have not heard them. Then in verse 34 it says, All these things speak Yeshua unto the multitude in parables. And without a parable spake he not unto them, that it might be fulfilled that which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. And Yeshua sent the multitude away, verse 36, and went into the house, and the disciples came unto him and saying, Declare unto us the parables of the tares. Let me give you an instance. Here was Yeshua teaching some profound things. After he taught, he would leave them. The people would go. What did you hear today? Hey, something wonderful. Hey, that man of Galilee. Hey, that man of Nazareth. Hey, that man of Capernaum. The thing he taught, hey, it was so sweet. What did he say? Nyonin. But the disciples, after Yeshua would speak, they'll come to him. They opened the door. Say, Master. Please declare to us. Please tell us what is it that you meant. In other words, the Lord wants us to be people who are inquirers. Be an inquisitive one. It is good thing in the kingdom. You hear something you don't understand, ask a question. Even as we are here now, blog along. Say what you didn't understand. You need help. Okay, somebody will look out for it and answer you or send an inbox. Have an inquisitive mindset. Men and brethren, why? As the kingdom is planted in the earth rim, Satan is also busy planting tares. People who outwardly look like saints in the physical church, but they are not really part of the church. Their heart is caked. They are full of iniquity. They are full of evil. They are full of negativities. Nothing good in them. Nothing clean, nothing pure, and all. That's what Yeshua told them in Matthew 13, 24, 30. I've told you in one of the courses we did, there are four types of church on earth. There is the church that Yeshua is building, the kingdom church. Then there is the church that Satan is building, the satanic church. And they use charms, means, all kinds of things to trap the souls of men. There is also the church of men. Where human beings with their crafty minds and hearts and emotion and, you know, they are, they, are, they are a force of personality to trap people who will feed their bellies. And they say their God is their belly. And then number four, there is the hybrid church, which is a mixture. Take a little thing here and there and put it all together. And it's a very dangerous situation. Which one are you in? Which one are you part of? What are you part of? Do you know we are talking about eternity? How is it that people are joking with eternity? How is it that people are joking? You see things that are unbiblical, things that are no foundation in scripture. You don't care. You don't mind because you didn't esteem your, your, your eternal state as important enough. So brothers and sisters, that's why Yeshua now taught that the kingdom of heaven, wherever it is planted, if it is real, it will spread. It will grow and spread the kingdom. That is why in the kingdom church, you don't bother about having a congregation of 5 or 10 or 15. No, those things do not figure. That's what the worldly church does. It wants numbers. Satanic church wants numbers. It do anything, manipulates anything to get numbers. All kinds of insincerities go into it. But if it is a kingdom church, start small. Be content with walking at the pace of God. At the appointed time, he will grow it. In Matthew chapter 13, verse 31, 32, another kingdom put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like to a grain of mustard seed, which a man took 
and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all seeds, but when it is grown, it is the greatest amongst herbs, and becometh a tree, so that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. So if it is of the kingdom, if it could be one person or two, just keep on, the kingdom will grow. The kingdom church will grow. And when it grows, it will have no limits. The birds of the air will come and lodge in the branches. There will be room for people from all over the world. Because the gospel of the kingdom is not cultural specific. It's universal. Then he gave them another parable about how the kingdom message works. He says in verse 33 of Matthew 13, the king, another parable speaking unto them, the kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal until the whole was leavened. What is leaven? Leaven is yeast. What is meal? Meal is either flour or whatever. So you take, let's say this is yeast, you put it in the floor, you mix it all up in the floor and close it up. You know what? With time in the oven, it begins to grow. Yeshua came from heaven, affected 12 people, key, and another 70 people and another 120 people, another 500 people. You know what? From that small number, 12 and 120 in the upper room, by Acts 17, the testimony was, come and see the people who have turned the world upside down. Everything in the kingdom starts small. Don't despise the door of small beginnings. If you, if you have to start a neighborhood fellowship with your neighbors, go ahead and start it. If the Lord has given you favor with all the moms that... You know, you know, come to drop their children in school and you see your own children, you drop and you have favor with them and you can invite them. Oh, when you finish, can, let's have a cup of tea, cup of cappuccino, cup of coffee and then share a little scripture, 30 minutes, encourage them that they go their way or whatever arrangement. Listen, brethren, in a proper environment where nothing is done secretly or, you know, under wraps, but truly where you are connected, you're able to share with your leader, listen, there's this opportunity in my workplace, you know, to do a fellowship in the midday, you know, during the break time, that little thing can grow tomorrow to be the, that's the way of the kingdom. Growth is organic, not organizational. It's organic growth, and it is so important. Don't despise it those small beginnings. Amen and brethren, the kingdom is only for those who highly esteem and desire it to the degree that they are willing to pay the price of letting go every other thing to possess it. That's what he said in Matthew 13, 44. And again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in a field, the which, when a man had found, he hid it, and for joy thereof, goeth and selleth all that he had, and buyeth that field. Oh, you... You, you found a land, you know, maybe you rented it, and as you were digging for a garden, you struck something hard. What is it? You look through gold. You strike again gold. You close up. You go to that gold. They are gold. You know what? You go. I said to the owner, please, this place I lease from you, I really would like to buy it. He said, I'm not selling it. He said, listen, I want to say something to you. That garden has been good to me. And I have actually sold my existing place to buy it. And let's say the price of that place, the highest it can fetch is $100,000. You offer him half a million. You offer him 700000 You offer him a million. You give it to him. He rejoices. He has gotten something. He rejoices. He throws a party. What he doesn't know is that right in that place that he sold you for one million, there's enough to mine a billion dollar watch. And do you know what, brothers and sisters, that you esteem the kingdom so highly. You know, it surprises me that with all the Lord is releasing, 
in this generation about the fivefold, about the priesthood after the order of Melchizedek. There are people who hear all that. They still go and intermingle themselves with mono gift ministry, with, 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 with a Nimrodic ministry, with Levitical ministry. They still go and intermingle themselves. They have no fear of Elohim that the truth you know is supposed to have set you free. People are playing games with Elohim. You, you know what? In the kingdom, you sell all to possess. And then in verse 45, 46, again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls. That's what he trades in. The pearl is of great price. Who, when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. That is how the kingdom of heaven is. You are bullied to esteem it so highly that you are willing to forsake and forgo all else to be a possessor of the kingdom. Brothers and sisters, that's what it should take. And that's why the Lord taught something interesting. He says, you know, religious leaders, they love their high seats, their thrones. They love all those things, their countrymen, the robes, the caps, everything, the staff of office, and the people who come and worship them. But he says something should happen, something that is very critical. In Matthew 13, 52, and he said unto them, therefore, every scribe, which is instructed unto the kingdom of heaven, is like unto a man that is an householder, which bringeth forth out of his treasure things new and old. Anyone who has been in religion, who began to be open to the teaching of the scriptures concerning the kingdom, and you catch the revelation, and you embrace the revelation, he says you are like somebody who could bring forth of your treasure the new and the old. That is to say, you stand at an advantage over those who don't know about it. So, it is important, therefore, to know that the kingdom also confers authority on those who embrace it. One of them is the authority to bind and to lose, Matthew 16, 19. And I give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, the keys of the kingdom of heaven, that whatsoever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. The key of the authority of the name of Yeshua. The key of the power of the blood. That if you can exercise it by faith, you can stop circumstances. You can stop situations. Even young people, you can exercise the authority of the kingdom in your school, in your home, in your environment. Brothers and sisters, the Lord wants us to know we should esteem the kingdom highly. And that is why the Lord says, before you can truly enter the kingdom or enjoy the kingdom, there's something the Lord is looking for us. Human beings are complex. People like to wear beautiful clothing on the outward. People like to do the Photoshop faces, take their pancake, take their mascara, put everything, but inside another thing altogether. Look at what the Lord said about the kingdom. In Matthew 18, 1, at the same time came the disciples unto him, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And then what did he do? He brought to them a child. And said in verse 3, Very like unto you, except you be converted and become as little children, sincere, transparent, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. The Lord wants us to be transparent people. We don't play games in the kingdom. We don't do politics in the kingdom. We don't try to be one thing here, another thing there. We don't try to be, you know, laugh with people and inside. We are burning and burning and burning and we are full of wrath and anger and offense. The Lord wants us to be people who truly are open, are transparent and give him space to do what he wants to do in our life. In that same Matthew 18, verse 23 and 35, he says something. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king which would take account of his servants. And then he began to take account. And there he says, somebody was forgiven and the person refused to forgive. You know the warning he gave in verse 35. So likewise shall my heavenly father do also unto you if you from your hearts Forgive not one his brother their trespasses. We are not supposed to just forgive. 
in the lips. It should be from the heart. Forgive. Forgive people their trespasses. People are going to trespass against you. People you do good to will do you evil. People will sp you speak good about, they speak evil to your back. People are going to try to pull you down. They are going to try to destroy the work the Lord gave to you. But you must have a heart that even before they sin against you, you are forgiving them. It doesn't matter what it is. The day you can excuse yourself that there are certain things you can retain, that's the day you start your problem. Because the Bible said in the book of John 20, whatever sin you remit is remitted. Whatever sins you choose to retain is retained. And I want to encourage us, let's receive what the Lord is saying. The Lord is saying that the kingdom of heaven is a place also where sacrifice defines our work with the Lord. For instance, in Matthew 19, 12, For there are some eunuchs which were so born from their mother's womb. And there are some eunuchs which were made eunuchs of men. And there be eunuchs which have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He that is able to receive it, let him receive it. Here the Lord is saying about what Paul wrote about the gift of celibacy. He said, listen, I wish everybody was like me. You know why? Because he says, so that I have nothing to limit me, nothing to break my focus. I am wholly invested in the work of the Lord. And there are those who are receiving that grace across the world. And the Lord says, you know what? It's sacrifice for his name's sake. And he said, those who can receive it, let them receive it. And that's why the Lord also talks about childlikeness. Again, just as he said in Matthew 18, in Matthew 19, he said something, verse 19, verse 14, where Yeshua said, Suffer little children and forbid them not to come unto me, for such is the kingdom of heaven. I want you to see how many kingdom of heaven we have spoken about in this lesson today. Kingdom of heaven. Kingdom of heaven. Why? Matthew wrote for the Jewish audience. And he was writing in the language that is sensitive to their culture. They don't talk about the name of God anyhow. Matthew couldn't have written kingdom of God, kingdom of God. This many times we've read, it will, be, it will, have, been, it will have offended the sensitivities of his listeners. In verse 23 of Matthew 19, Yeshua said unto his disciples, Very I say unto you, that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. Did he mean that wealth disqualifies people? No. He meant this young man who was so much, had so much stuff that the thought of leaving them for Yeshua was so terrible that he literally walked away from Yeshua. Anybody who allows wealth to grip the heart, that you don't care what you do, you just want your money. You don't care the laws of Elohim you break, kingdom laws you break, just you want your money, you want that money, you want it, and you are ready to do anything to get it. At that stage, there is danger. But if you are faithful in seeking for the kingdom and righteousness, the things people are chasing for, the Lord will give you wisdom. You could be asleep, and the Lord will give you one simple formula that you put it to work, and that formula can make you a multi-millionaire. That is the word of the kingdom. Because the Lord will give it to you as a location for your assignment. So it's no more about lusting. It's no more about what you're going to use to feel good and, and, and make money or, or compete with people. But that which, which you are going to fulfill destiny. And that is why men and brethren, the Lord makes it clear to us. Concerning the kingdom of heaven, the time you started is not the issue. The time you started is not the issue. It is how well did you end. And so he gave a parable in the book of Matthew 20, 1 to 16. The man who went out and got laborers. After some time, he went and got more laborers. After some time, he got more laborers. In the end, when he was paying them, he was giving everybody their due, starting from the last. And then as he was giving the last person whom he called his due, the people who came earlier thought, well, this man must surely multiply our money because, you know, we have worked double, triple the time of this. He said, no, it's not so. He told them something. He told them, did we not negotiate that this is your fee? Then what is it to you if I give the man who came only one hour before the close of the work? So also, you know, there are people who started this race so many years, and when they look at you now, 
the way you are pressing into the kingdom, they want to sneer at you. They want to say this one, uh, don't worry, she'll fag out. She's going to crash out. Listen to this. Remember Pastor Grace? Somebody said to her, when she said, I'm born again, I'm born again, out of excitement, say, you, this you, <laughs> we watch you. <laughs> Let's see what happens. You say, you watch me forever. Brothers and sisters, learn to say to people, you watch me forever. In other words, if you have taken your life and surrender to the Lord, keep pressing in. Because the Bible says, listen to this. Matthew 20 verse 16. So the last shall be the first, and the first the last. For many be called, but few are chosen. So it doesn't matter if you were just saved 10 years ago, 5 years ago, 3 years ago, even 1 year. The person who was saved 35 years does not have any advantage over you. If only you will stay on the lane and be like Benignus and run and run and overtake and be there and press the tape. So shall it be. So in the kingdom, many may, may be called, but few are chosen because the vast majority don't want to pay the price of enthroning Yeshua as Lord. They want to do their stuff and bring it to Yeshua to rubber stamp for them. Men and brethren, allow the Lord to deliver you from ABC churchianity, attendance, building cash. Go and be an instrument of building the kingdom. And that's why the Lord wants us to know much as he wants us to come into his kingdom, wants us to be saved, wants us to come and come, let's be careful that we have the right equipment. In the book of Matthew chapter 22 from verse 2, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king which made a marriage for his son and sent forth his servants to call them that were bidding to the wedding. And they will not come. Again, he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidding, Behold, I prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready. Come unto the marriage. But they made light of it, and went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. And the remnant took his servants and entreated them spitefully, and slew them. But when the king had thereof, he was wrought. And he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, The wedding is ready. But they which were bidden were not worthy. Go ye therefore unto the highways, and as many as you shall find, bid them to the marriage. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together as many as they found, both bad and good. And the wedding was furnished with guests. And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. And he said unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. <laughs> this is interesting. And then said the king to the servants, Bind him and hand and foot, and make, take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There be, shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called and few, but few are chosen. He needed guests. Say, go, highway. This is you and I. From the Gentile nations, the forgotten nations, what was prepared for people, they were not there to receive it. They treated his son badly, and the Lord said, go and pick them. It doesn't matter where they are. Pacific Island, Asia, Africa, Europe, North America, South America, in the oceans, the island nations, go and get them. And now we've come. And the king came to inspect his banquet. So one, without a wedding garment. You say you are in the kingdom, but you are not converted. You are not saved. You say in the kingdom, and you are not pressing in to be like him. You know, it's a dangerous thing to do. It's easy to play religion. But the Lord is saying, there's a dimension of possession of your heart, of your mind, of your will that I want to possess, that I can decorate you with Yeshua, that you wear him like a garment. Brothers and sisters, let's press in. Let's press on so that we're not going to be like the hypocrites who will do everything. Yeshua said of them in Matthew 23, 13, But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. And that's what's happening. Some people are just, 
doing all kinds of games, religious games in the household of Elohim, causing confusion, causing strife, looking for who they were going to quarrel with. And in the process, they are making the kingdom message look so terrible. True kingdom citizens, therefore, will be watchful and vigilant, expecting their king to return without warning. That's the import of Matthew 25, 1 to 14. The wise virgins who had oil in their lamps, so that when the voice came, behold, the bridegroom cometh, you know what? They are ever ready to go in with him to the marriage supper. Let's not be like the foolish virgins who went to sleep in Matthew 25, verse 1 to 13. They went to sleep. The Lord says, if you truly have the kingdom in your heart, then one of the things that should happen to you is absolute certainty that the king is coming. And since the king is coming and nobody knows the day and time, you are willing, more than willing, to more than willing, you are willing to embrace the salvation of the Lord your Elohim. You are willing to remain in him. You are willing to wait for him. And it enables you to know what to do, what to take on board, what not to take on board. When the king shall come, shall he find unfaithfulness in you? Shall he find duplicity in you? Shall you find some hidden agenda in you? Some character flaws you have not dealt with? Uh, can he, will he find in you reliability? You know, these days, people don't know what faithfulness is. The body of Yeshua has taken faithfulness and thrown it to the ground. When the Son of Man shall come, will he find you faithful? And he says, watch and pray. The wind is going to come to try to blow people off course. And that is why the Lord wants us to know he has given us gifts and talents for the purpose of doing kingdom business. Not running our ministry, not uh, fulfilling our fancies. If you look at Matthew 24, I mean 25 from verse 14 all the way to verse 30, it talks about the king giving, you know, talent, gold, assets to his servants and say, go and use it to do kingdom business. At the end of the day, what are you doing with the gifts and callings of the Lord? Have you discovered the gifts of God? The where you are, have you taken your place effectively in the kingdom community the Lord connected you? Can you say in all truth that you are effectively giving all to build the body where the Lord planted you? If not, why not? And so that is why the Lord also wants us to know that even acts of kindness done in his name towards other people who are suffering, who are going through, prisoners, homeless people, you know, all manner of people who are going through. There are many people who are going to sleep in this winter in London, homeless. There are people who are going to be homeless. They will sleep on top of graveyards, gravestones in London. There are people who are going to be sleeping in alleyways and the yops in various cities can kill them because of the hatred they have to, when they see people who are not like them, who are just hanging out. What do you do to them? Matthew 25, verse 31. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations. And he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divided his sheep from the goats, and he set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. There's a kingdom prepared for us. The Lord wants us to inherit that kingdom. And all he's teaching us in this course is to position us to be able to inherit the kingdom for what, and you know, you know what? And the people began to worry. How is it? Verse 35. For I was unhungered, you gave me meat. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger, you took me in. Naked, you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee, and hungered, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw we thee, a stranger, and took thee in, naked, and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee, sick, or in prison, and came unto thee? And the king shall answer, and say unto them, 
Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as you have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. Whatever we do in his name for the benefit of those who cannot repay, we are doing it to him. He who gives to the poor is learning to Elohim to repay. The kingdom of heaven, as recorded by Matthew, it was awesome. And the Lord wants us to know that this kingdom is worth dying for. Paul died for it. Peter died for it. John died for it. Those who follow Yeshua, they died for it. This kingdom is worth sacrificing all for. This kingdom is to be esteemed so highly that every other thing will be secondary. Nothing should subordinate the kingdom. If we seek the kingdom above all material things, seek the rulership of Yeshua in our heart, and latch our mind and our heart to the day he will return to rule and reign on earth, and we live within the framework of the kingdom within and the kingdom come, we will not sin against Elohim, we will not make mistakes, we will not stumble. The Lord will plant our feet on solid ground. Brothers and sisters, we love you dearly and we're sharing these things so that you know that the Lord has great love for you. By way of assignment, number one, please summarize the most important lessons you personally learned from this Bible survey of the kingdom as recorded by Matthew. Summarize. Give us about five core lessons you are taking home. And then number two, please cite ten of the scriptures in this lesson which came alive for you, which touched you in the innermost being and caused you to feel something of the demand of the Lord upon you. We're going to pray right now. Father in heaven, the great I am who I am, we love you dearly and we ask you to have your way. Let your name be glorified. Lord, that which you have sown in us, let it not be taken away by the birds of the air, but rather, Lord, let it be marinated in our heart, in our mind. Let it settle in our heart, transforming our hearts, renewing our minds. And Father, do what only you can do to bring us to that place where the kingdom is evident. The rulership of Yeshua in us, the sovereign rule of Yeshua is evident by your spirit leading us in all things. And therefore, put us in a place where when he returns, we are going to rule and reign with him in the manifest kingdom. Thank you for answering our prayer. To you be all honor and glory. There is no Elohim besides you. In Yeshua Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen.